tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. When I first saw the devil, he was the size of a flea. A speck of obsidian resting gently on my chest. I stood in the shower, a lanky 11-year-old, in the last carefree moment of my life. I spotted him there, clinging tightly to my ribs like a tick. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if I hadn't seen him. Would it have been easier not knowing? I didn't think much of it at first. Tried to pick him off, only he began to writhe. His strange and sporadic movements, so apparently evil and unnatural, triggered a primeval revulsion. The panic sank in when he made a tiny cut in my flesh and disappeared beneath my skin. I began to scratch frantically, the water from the shower mingling with the tears now streaming down my face. I didn't understand. What was it? What was in me? I scratched until the skin hung from my chest in ribbons, and my blood poured down the sink. Looking down now, I could still see the white raised flesh running my fingers along the smooth ridges of scar tissue. I can remember the pain and anxiety of that moment, of the end of my childhood. I don't know how long I was there, but it was long enough for my parents to know something was wrong. I never knew if they heard me crying or didn't hear anything at all, but suddenly my mother was with me. She was holding me close to her, soaking her sweater, shushing me as I collapsed into a shivering puddle in her arms. I remember her crying for my father as I shuddered against her, bleeding. I didn't understand what was happening, and how could I? I was only a boy. They took me to the doctor, my mom and dad, and he bandaged me up. He asked why I had done it, and I explained what I had seen. He listened to me very intently while my mother sat next to me, staring at my face, while hers was a grim mask of concern. My father had left the office and I didn't know why, and she didn't know why, and maybe he didn't know why either. Maybe he didn't want to know what had happened, or already did. The doctor sat, listened, and waited patiently while my mother soothed me as I cried hysterically. He waited for me to calm down, to finish my story. I don't know what it was. I remember sobbing, inconsolable and afraid. But I think it's still in me. It's in my chest. Sam, he finally asked me, his voice level and low. Do you ever have nightmares? I nodded at him. Sometimes nightmares can be real, Sam. They crawl right out of our heads into the world and take root in our lives. You did the right thing, Sam. And your mother did the right thing bringing you to me. I'm going to take an x-ray, Sam. And I'm going to take your blood. And I'm going to look in your chest with an ultrasound. If I find evidence that that thing was real, that it was more than just a waking dream, I'll scratch it out of your chest. How's that sound? They showed me the x-ray. There was nothing. They showed me the ultrasound. The first time I had seen one since before my brother was born. Maybe we just can't see it. I had argued, knowing that the thing had to be lurking behind the shapeless gray of the picture. The doctor shook his head. I've read your blood, Sam, and there's nothing. You had a bad dream, a nightmare in the waking world. They're scary, Sam, but they happen. You did the right thing. And with that, he sent me home. My mother sat at the foot of my bed that night, and the next. But the night after, my brother was up with a bad cough, so she stayed with him. My dad, for his part, picked us up from the doctor's office and hardly mentioned what had happened again. That night, though, he made me hamburgers. 
and that weekend he let me stay up late with him when my mom was out at choir, and we watched old science fiction movies until I fell asleep on the couch. Things went back to normal for a while. Not for a long time, but long enough so that I didn't think twice when I felt the devil in my hand at school. I had never been violent, never made trouble. I was a sweet kid. I remember that. I remember feeling that way, sweet and nice, and taking pride in that. I remember an older kid pushed me. I didn't know him and it wasn't a big thing, just kids being kids. I remember feeling a twitch in my right hand, feeling my fingers curl tight into a fist. I remember splitting his lip and wondering what the hell had happened as a teacher pulled me away from him. That's how the devil operates. First, he works his way into your hand. He wasn't strong yet, so he couldn't move it all the time. But there were small moments when my guard was down. That wasn't the last time I'd throw a punch, and I felt him there every time. I felt him when I shoved my brother later that year, and I felt him when I reached for a knife in the block when my dad started to yell. I was a sweet kid. I was still sweet. That doesn't just go away. I would be terrified after those moments. I would wail out in pain that I didn't know what was happening and didn't know why it was happening to me. For a long time, people forgave me. For a long time, they tried to help. My dad spent every weekend taking me on little day trips, doing activities with me, and I could see how jealous it made my little brother, and that made me sad. Only I loved the attention too. My mom told me how much she loved me, consoled me when I cried late at night, and she took me to therapists, behavioral specialists, and whatever she could think to try. It took a while for me to make the connection, but talk enough about your problems to anyone, and you start to see the patterns. It's a nightmare. I remember saying to one of the endless trains of specialists or child psychologists one afternoon. It crawled into my chest and grew down my arm. He moves my hand sometimes, I think. He makes me do things. The devil, the man had told me, is real. The devil works through men. The devil has taken root in you. What can I do? I asked him. Why is this happening to me? You can resist. You can always resist because, in a righteous body, the devil can make no home. And feeding on a righteous soul, the devil will starve. Maybe he was right, but I don't think so. I don't know what righteous means or what he meant by it anyways, but I was a sweet kid. There wasn't evil in me, wasn't badness, only he didn't go away. The more he stuck around, the more I became convinced that what he did was my fault. I was angry, frustrated, and scared, and I turned that all inward. People forgave me for a long time and pitied me, but over time they began to turn. My teachers first, and friends, they were afraid of me, or else they hated me, or else both. Sometimes they would act kind, but always they watched my hand with a suspicious eye, and I knew it. And I knew they were right to do so. My brother hated me next, and I didn't blame him. I struck him repeatedly, stole our parents' attention, and though I sobbed and begged him to forgive me, he was a kid. He wanted a normal life, a normal brother, and I was a burden. My mother and father never hated me, but they hated what I was doing to them. I could see that. They had no time for my brother. They had no time for each other. They had no time for themselves. I was their life, and I was a misery, and I made them miserable. Despite their growing tired and distant, I didn't blame them either. I didn't blame any of them, because more than any of them, I hated me for what I was becoming. I hated myself. I hated myself, became angry and bitter, and filled my chest with that hatred and bitterness. The devil had crawled into me, 
and then he had made me into his home, a dark and lonely place soured by bitterness and regret, and once it was to his liking, he ate his fill. Soon it was not just my hand that the devil worked, but my legs, arms, head, and heart. I could feel him raise me out of bed in the morning, and I could feel him lay me down every night. I lived like that for many years. I left my home broken, tore my family apart, and never looked back. They were better off, I thought. The devil was there for every man or woman that I hurt. He was there every time I lifted a bottle to my lips or a needle to my arm. He was there, always there. I was an instrument of the devil for many years, a fact I will always have to live with. I don't ask for forgiveness or compassion, but I promise that it is impossible to understand the pain of those years without living through them. Dark and sickly tendrils wrapped up and down every muscle fiber, choked every vein, and tortured every bundle of nerves. At times, I tried to fight his promptings, and the pain was unbelievable. More than that, I had to see with a clear mind what I was doing, and the pain of that was worse. I'm ashamed to admit that I went to sleep for a long time only to protect myself. I think about that time often. In my weakest moments, I even tried to convince myself that it wasn't real, that I was really sleeping, and that it was all a dream. I know that's not true. I know it's an insult to the people I heard to let myself believe that, and it's selfish and cowardly. I try to remember it often. I remind myself that I was there and knew what he was doing. I say I was asleep and I like to think of it that way sometimes, but only because it's an easy lie. Looking back, I remember times when I would open my eyes and wonder who the hell had made the life I was living. I remembered it, only it was like they were someone else's memories. I had become a cruel person. I was petty and small, and I felt small. I brought people into my life and I made them hurt, and I knew I was doing it and was glad I was doing it. The devil took my body in those years, but it's a lie to say that he took my mind. Maybe I really couldn't help what I was doing, but to survive it, I made myself into the sort of person who could do those things and walk away from them. I wished I was dead. I should have been dead a thousand times. I tried to end it all, but he would never let me. As dark and insidious as he was, as total as his control over me was, he needed me. I don't think he would ever really die, even if I had the strength to end my own life, but he didn't want to start again as a speck of obsidian in the heart of a child. He had plans for me. So it was that I made my way into the world for a long time, hurting people and myself. I would think back to that man years ago, telling me that the devil could take root in the breast of a righteous man. I lost faith that a righteous person could exist until I met Katerina. From the moment I saw her, I knew she was strong in all the ways that I was weak and was steady in all the ways that I had faltered. He knew it too, I could tell, because as drawn as I was to her, so he was repulsed. From the day that she first smiled at me, I felt his barbed grip down my legs convulsing, seizing my muscles, trying to run. For the first time in many years, I stood firm, despite the pain. She saw me, really saw me, past all the misery and bullshit. You're sweet, she said to me, and I laughed bitterly, angrily, as she put her hand on mine. You are, she had said, looking in my eyes, and I remembered the boy that I had been, the boy who had taken pride in kindness and despaired in others' misery. And though my muscles tightened and my nerves cried out, I stayed with her. I knew then 
that I would rather live with his torment than flee and lose her forever. The devil heard my heart and changed his tack, and I felt the shift. Fine, Bill. He whispered down my spine with the voice of shattered teeth. She's both of ours. As forceful as his first instinct to flee had been, he redoubled his efforts when he decided to make me hurt her. I did my best to choke him back, but he was always there, like when I was a child, waiting for me to drop my guard. In an instant, we could be laughing, and I would feel him clench my fist, and I would run for the door. She saw all of this, despite my shame and efforts to hide him. Unlike my brother, though, she did not come to hate me, and unlike my parents, she did not come to resent me. I don't forgive you, she would whisper. Because there is nothing to forgive, mi amor. I know your heart. Despite her reassurances, I knew that one way or another, he would win out one day. One day, if I gave him enough chances, he would find the right moment. He would hurt her badly enough that it would be the end of both of us because he hated her every bit as much as I loved her. So I would give him what he had wanted from the start. I would leave her, or else she would finally have enough and would leave me, and she'd be right to do it. Not today, though, I would think every morning. Not now, while the air is so sweet with the first blossoms of spring, and the evenings are so dark and cool, and I can feel her nestled into me, not sleeping, but not still fully awake. Not now, but soon. Soon. And then it happened the way these things do. And she told me the news. We were going to have a daughter. And at that moment, my world fell apart and I could feel him swell in my breast, sure now of his victory. She would never leave me now, I knew. And I could never leave her. Our end seemed to be inevitable, and all the more tragic now that we were bringing an innocent into our world. He was hungry for them both. I cried first, and then she did. I told her to leave, and she refused. I rose up to her and roared, and for the first time I saw that she was afraid, really afraid. And it wasn't him she was afraid of. It was me. Again, I told her to leave, and between shaky breaths, she gathered her things and left. She would be back. I knew because I would beg her to come back. Kill me, I begged him then. Do what you need to with me, and then kill me. Just leave her, please. You can have it all, I told him daily. But not that. And with that, he took me again, reveling in the control that I once again relinquished, though our roles had reversed in a sense. He went about his day and choked me back, but when I felt him drift to her, I seized my muscles, dug in my heels, and made both of us hurt. I fell into myself then, into a world where every day was indiscernible from my dreams and my dreams haunted my every hour. It had been like that before, but it was different now, worse because I saw her in my dreams. Sometimes I was holding her, and sometimes I was hurting her, and both pained me so much I could hardly bear it. Over time, though, I started to have a different dream. I saw the force sometimes, a long-off memory from visits as a child with my father. At first, only the briefest moments came to me. Glimpses of myself walking, haggard and hungry, my feet bleeding and torn. I saw the bird. Always, always, always I saw the bird. Guiding me. Linking the pieces together. Making the dream a story. I ignored my waking life knew that I would feel the quickening in my pulse and the fire in my blood should the devil try to bring me to her, 
and I focused on the dream. It became real, more real than anything. And as it sharpened in my mind, one day I felt the devil struggling as I walked. And I realized that it was no longer a dream. I had stripped my feet bare and started down the city streets. It was a hot day and I walked for many hours until the city turned into suburbs like the ones I had grown up in. And my skin began to burn. My feet began to ache, blister, and bleed. I did not stop walking as night fell, nor did I stop as the sun rose again. My whole body was in pain, and I didn't know the toll of my march and what punishment he had tried to inflict, but it didn't matter. I was of a singular mind, and strength and force of will I didn't know that I had compelled me to walk on. I walked until the suburbs turned to dirt roads and the houses turned to trees and I was in the wilderness of my youth and still I walked. I walked further than I had ever gone, further than I had ever heard of anyone going. I walked past the fairy circles and the standing stones deep into the heart of the wild where I'd been told that no man could return from. I walked until the sky was blood red shining even through an impossibly thick canopy above me. The air was thick with bird song, and the loamy earth was soft against my broken feet. I walked until I could not walk any longer, and lay down in the dirt. I lay and let the song of the birds blanket me, and decided that the dreams had been sent by some benevolent force to finally bring me to my death, which was good and right. I felt the devil twitch in my chest, but knew that he was every bit as exhausted by his struggles against me as I was against him. I thought that it was right that we should lie here, worn and broken together. I closed my eyes and expected never to open them again. The sun red on my face and the bare earth under my back. Soon after, though, I felt the leathery talons on my chest. I ignored them for a while, and though I could feel them both powerful and sharp, they didn't try to hurt me. A crow, black as the night sky, just as proud and terrifying, stands on my chest staring at me. The creature, whatever it was, waited patiently for me to turn my head up, for me to muster the energy to open my eyes, for my vision to clear as I adjusted again to the light. And there he was. His eyes were dark, reflecting the red light and the stars in the sky. And he stared at me, and I knew what he had to do. I was afraid I could feel how strong he was, how surprisingly heavy. But I nodded at him and lifted my shirt. He looked at me a while longer, and then without warning, he leaned down and cut into me with his beak just below the rib cage, with all the precision of a surgeon. The pain tore through me, a fire in my belly, and I was filled with an agony far greater than I would have expected. Only I was afraid to move, afraid that if I did he would cut something he didn't mean to. Instead, I gritted my teeth, filled my hands with the dirt below me, threw my head back, and waited for it all to end. After a while, I felt him lift his head, and I looked down for a moment and saw the blood coming from the wound, thick and black, pouring over my skin in inky rivulets. He leaned down again, then grabbed something and pulled, and the pain was like nothing I had ever known. Whatever he had pulled back, I felt its barbs in every muscle, wrapped around every vein, bundled with every nerve. I felt every muscle spasm as my heart began to race. Sweat poured down my face, and the crow continued pulling, pulling, and pulling. I wanted to scream, and I wanted to run. Only I knew that the crow would never come for me again, and I knew that none of it would give until it all gave. And so I waited still, waited for an end to it, waited 
for something to give finally. And then, all at once, it did give. In some places I felt it slide free, and in others I felt it snap. But suddenly there was no pulling, and when I dared again to lift my head and look at the crow, I saw the devil in his beak. The crow had held a central mass in its beak, and from that grew a thousand tendrils, some whisper thin and some thicker than my finger. He was dark, oily, and smooth, and seemed to shine red in the light of that place. Some were long and terminated in sharp spiked barbs. Others were broken, some near the end and others near the base. They all oozed blackness into the light. Some dripped on my skin and burned to the touch. All the tendrils jerked and curled erratically, and the knowledge that he had lived inside me for so long filled me with a deep and lingering dread. I don't know. I stared at the crow still, wanting to ask him something. If there was more to get out, and if the blackness that was bleeding still inside me would hurt. Instead, I said nothing. As the steam curled from the wound in my chest, shocked by the pain of what I had just seen. The crow stared at me for a while longer too, and I remember wondering what he was trying to communicate and wishing desperately that I could speak. Fluid from the devil's bleeding heart ran down his inky feathers, and I was worried that they'd choke the crow, but he was unconcerned. A moment later, he took to wing and flew away taking the devil with him. I lay there for a long time, not knowing what to do. Finally, I looked again at the hole in my chest, and I saw that the blood running from it was bright red, thinner than it had been. I pressed my hand to it, and it hurt, but I could sit up, and once I could sit up, I could stand, and once I could stand... I could walk. I made my way out of those wild lands where no man could wander and return, past the fairy circles and the standing stones, along the country roads and through the suburbs and the city streets, until I found my way home. I packed my chest with gauze and lay down in my bed alone, and when I woke, I was a new man. And I went to find Katarina. Life marches on. We have a daughter now who looks at me with joy in her heart, with eyes that have never seen the worst of me, her mother's eyes. I live my life, but I always watch my hand with a suspicious eye, and I know that I am right to do so because I know in my heart that someday he'll return and I know that the crow can't come again. I watch for a twitch of the finger, ready to destroy the hand, and I watch for the curling of a toe, ready to take the leg. I only pray for my daughter, for my wife, that when he returns, I have the strength to cut him out before he takes root somewhere dearer. The footsteps of people on the platform clattered and thumped as Aryam stood in the corner with her hands clasped over her ears. She closed her eyes, hoping to reduce her anxiety. She'd always hated loud noises. Once she owned a pair of noise-canceling headphones. Those, like most things in her life, were gone. Her son, Sung Ho, stood by her side patiently. When she opened her eyes, those big, beautiful browns were staring back. He had a curiosity about him well beyond his age. Although he spoke well for nine, he'd never overcome a terrible shyness and rarely spoke, even to his mother. What little she remembered of her home country didn't impress her. The ticket in her pocket read Texas, and she was grateful to escape the cold. She never cared for New England winters, and cared even less for Korea. 
Besides, how her mother spoke about it made her miss it less. Ariam checked over her shoulder every few seconds, expecting to see someone there. As she stepped through the crowd, she couldn't help feeling as if everyone were watching her. Their judgmental eyes took her in, watching her. Men in suits walked past, bumping elbows with denizens of the station. Overflowing trash cans stunk of yesterday's garbage. The cement benches in the center weren't stone gray, but riddled with graffiti, some of the images phallic in nature. Glitter blue with the slight breeze. An older man sat on the floor, drumming a rhythm on an overturned bucket. This had drawn Sung Ho's attention. With that mature curiosity, he watched as the man slapped his drumstick on plastic, creating a beat. A vendor cart sat in the corner of the platform, a dingy-looking thing, once white, beaten down by age. A smiling black man stood behind it, serving hot dogs for a dollar apiece. Sung Ho tugged at her sleeve and pointed to the cart, which he'd already been eyeballing herself. They hadn't eaten all day. Tied to the side of the cart were a handful of balloons placed there to draw in children. As Ariam stepped up to the cart, she observed the selection. There were only hot dogs and a few options for soda. And balloons. Sung Ho tugged at her sleeve and pointed at them. She nodded. They didn't have much money, and Texas was still long. They ordered two hot dogs and a balloon. Ariam smothered her dog in everything, hoping the toppings would add a little more caloric value. There weren't any available seats on the benches, which didn't bother her much. She could stand. They were going to be sitting for several hours. Ketchup had already covered Sung Ho's mouth. That boy never could keep clean. Aryan pointed at the ketchup, to which he shrugged. With a napkin, she wiped his face for him, making him squirm. They'd made short work of lunch. The dog was surprisingly good, considering she'd gotten it off a cart and for only a dollar. She took the time to tie the balloon around his wrist, then threw the doilies and napkins into the trash. The green balloon bounced up and down as Sung Ho ripped it out of the air and slapped it back up. Several times he did this with an obnoxious whap. To be a kid again, she thought distantly. Entertaining herself as an adult was expensive, but a cheap balloon could keep him occupied for hours. First, a strong horn blast warned of its arrival, followed by a rattle that shook the entire station. Everyone gathered in small lines. She watched this with fascination. All of these people had boarded this train numerous times before. Whack. Whack. Sung Ho slapped the balloon, missing a bald-headed man by inches. Another disapproving look from his mother got him to stop for the time being. Palming the balloon like a basketball, he moved his fingers on it, creating a squelching sound. As the vibrations of the train shook her legs, she wondered why the woman had been staring. An older woman with an expensive purse had been looking at her. Ever since childhood, she'd shied away from strangers' looks, so it wasn't that surprising that Sung Ho had picked up the same traits. The metallic screech of the brakes sent shockwaves that pierced her eardrums. She winced against the pain. The noise-canceling headphones would have done wonders. As if Sung Ho could read her mind, he gave her hand a gentle squeeze. The crowd bumped and pushed onto the train. She clung tightly to Sung Ho, desperate not to lose him. As people boarded, they trickled to their seats. Verifying with the ticket, she found their seats in the third car. They had no luggage to store. Sung Ho took the window seat, leaving her with the aisle. The man binging on the buckets outside the window stood and took a bow. A couple of people clapped, and he began gathering his things. A man in a blue suit with long, gangly fingernails walked up the aisle, stopping at each seat to ask for the tickets. 
The metal hole punch crunched with each one. He worked diligently, asking the occasional passenger a question or two. He feigned interest, but Ariam sensed danger. Something about him made her uneasy. As he got closer, she wondered what it was that gave her that feeling. He looked like any ordinary transit employee. Blue suit, hat, shiny shoes, and a pin. Everything looked normal, aside from his long nails. Perhaps it was the confidence with which he took authority, or the smile that said, I'm fooling all of you, and you're too stupid to see it. Her hands shook as she passed the ticket. A crooked smile crossed his face, and she imagined him using those crooked teeth to bite off children's fingers. Pain erupted in her mouth as she bit into her tongue to keep from responding to that horrendous thought. The whole punch crunched. Are you going to Texas for business or pleasure? He asked in a slow monotone. After imagining that, she found it difficult to look him in the face. My mother has fallen ill. With lips much too wet, the smile faded. Sorry to hear that. He returned the ticket stub and moved to the next seat. Business or pleasure? His voice continued. The crunching hole punch and the visual of him biting fingers paired into one treacherous thought. She shook her head, trying to free herself from it. Before it broke free from her psyche, she imagined that spittle on his lips like blood. This is how it starts. After the door swished open, she considered what she'd said and immediately regretted it. Her superstitious mother would never have forgiven her for such a lie. Ariam did not inherit her mother's beautiful green eyes, but she did inherit that awful feeling of dread and grief. She, like many Korean people, had the Han. The lie festered beneath her skin like an infection, and the more she thought about it, the closer it got to becoming gangrenous. I wouldn't have said it under ordinary circumstances. Now that she'd put it out there, she hoped it wouldn't come true. Their family had gone through enough. An image of her mother moving through the kitchen came to mind. Her hips swung to music from the old country. Oven mitts covered her hands, a smile on her face. A beautiful vision, if ever she'd had one. The smile faded. A wet, choking sound escaped her lips. Her hands ushered to her throat, and rivulets of blood spattered on the mitts. My mother has fallen ill. Sung Ho's hand fell on top of hers, startling her from the vision. A worried look covered his face, followed by a couple of pats. He said nothing, only held her hand in silence. He read her like a book at times, and she always wondered how. Even with the comfort of her son, Aryam struggled to shake off the hallucination. She tried to calm her ravaging heartbeat, sliding deeper into the seat. Using the breathing techniques Dr. Maverick taught her, Aryam eased out of the anxiety. If things got intolerable, she could always take the pills. The lump in her pocket assured her, her safety net. They had a lot of time to kill, and nothing to do. She didn't own a cell phone and hadn't brought anything to entertain themselves. The train clattered and woods flashed by the window. She wanted to entertain him, even if it didn't last long. The balloon had since been forgotten but she had to try. She held it out to him with a closed fist. Kai Bai Bo. At first, Sung Ho looked at her as if she were crazy. Then she bounced the fist a couple of times, and he got the gist. The first round, 
she'd gone paper and he'd gone rock. In the second round, he did paper and she switched to scissors. In the third round, she kept scissors and he'd gone paper. They went on like this until the sun knelt behind the trees. Sung Ho leaned his head on her shoulder and watched out the window as she ran her fingers through his hair. It didn't take long before his breathing changed. The thought of her ill mother returned. She envisioned her bent over, spattering blood from her mouth and painting the kitchen floor. After she'd said it, it became a possibility. Her hand crept over the pill bottle. But she didn't want to do that. A little longer, she told herself. She imagined someone finding her mother's body, and they too became sick. To occupy her wild imagination, Ariam observed the train car. Across the aisle seat sat an older black man with a newspaper. The light above him barely lit it, and she could tell he'd given up. It sat in his lap more as a decoration than anything. She began to think about his backstory, searching for clues, checking his shoes and his clothes, guessing approximately how much money he made. It all seemed rather boring. What she'd accessed as a teacher or an accountant wasn't good enough. Instead, she imagined him as a deacon or a religious leader of sorts. Her public school education and non-religious parents had left her incapable of telling the difference between the many denominations covering the Boston area, Lutheran, Baptist, Presbyterian. For a short period, she imagined him giving a sermon and the cadence of his voice, or at least the one she projected on him, brought her comfort. Ahead three rows sat a beautiful blonde who periodically stole glances to her right. Aryam imagined an equally attractive man, probably muscular and well-dressed. The mind games were fun. By the time the train had gone dark, she'd made up backstories for everyone she could see. She'd even come up with a story for the eerie ticket man who wandered in and out of the train car. She decided he wasn't a man at all, but the bringer of death. It was his job to escort people to either heaven or hell. My mother has fallen ill. She imagined her mother lying on the floor, blood dripping from her mouth, those beautiful green eyes wide open, staring at her, knowing. Perhaps the ticket man would come to collect her. If Ariam could, she'd have called her mother and confessed. She would have begged for forgiveness, and only then she'd be free of the awful thoughts and the guilt. The door next to the car swooshed open, and she saw something. It took her a long time to determine what she'd seen or what she thought she saw. In the next car stood a man, dressed in black, holding what looked like a cane. He'd been prodding someone with it, perhaps poking them while they slept. The thought made her chuckle based on its sheer lunacy. To her left, the man coughed. An uneasy feeling raised goose flesh on her skin. She just envisioned her mother hacking blood onto the kitchen floor, and now the man next to her had a tickle in his throat. Although a coincidence, she didn't like it. Then, she thought about the spread. Her foot repeatedly tapped against the floor. Sung Ho rustled off her shoulder and leaned against the window, where his breath pattered the glass. The balloon hovered freely above his head. A couple of times his eyelids flickered, as if he were in the depths of a fascinating dream. Once, she'd even sworn he'd made a noise, like a kitten's mew. The man coughed again. Aryam turned to him, hoping he was all right. What she saw instead was an increase of coughs, deeper and wetter. With a hand to his mouth, the man's eyes bulged. Desperation and confusion covered his face. A heinous chorus of croaks and gags filled the interior of the train car. A few rows ahead, more coughs erupted. The blonde woman who'd stolen glances at the hunk next to her 
a hand covered her mouth. A million bizarre thoughts ran through her mind, one of them being that it, whatever it could be, might be coming in from the window. She also noticed that she wasn't coughing. The door swished open again. On the far side of the door, she saw him. Dressed completely in black, bearing a cane, he wore a mask like a bird with goggles. He used the cane to push at someone on the floor. They weren't sleeping. They were dead. Just before the door word closed, he looked at her. Her breath caught in her throat. The escalation of her heart rate rattled in her temples. Guilt poured over her, knowing that she'd brought this hell upon herself. Quickly, she pulled the orange bottle from her pocket and stared at the pills. She contemplated taking them and even rattled the container to see how many she had left. Instead of taking them, she pushed the bottle back into her pocket and closed her eyes. When her eyes opened, the ticket man stepped through the door. There wasn't anyone standing behind him in the next car. No bird-like mask, no goggles, and no cane. Simply the ticket man asking, business or pleasure? Their eyes met momentarily. The uneasy feeling remained and something about him rose her defenses. The image of him biting off children's fingers returned, and the sound that echoed through her mind nearly made her cry. It sounded a bit like the snap of a carrot. Ariam clasped her hands over her ears and tried the breathing techniques again. She tried to recall all the tips Maverick had told her, but he'd always reverted back to the medication. As her thoughts cleared, the man to her left wasn't dying of a coughing fit. He'd reclined his seat the allotted three inches and had his hands crossed just above his pot belly. With his eyes closed, he looked peaceful. She thanked her lucky stars that it wasn't reality, but only some dimension of hell she'd glimpsed in on. One she'd probably created with that lie. She would take whatever chain she had and find a payphone, or she'd beg for it if she had to. She'd call her mother and set everything straight. Riddled with anxiety, she couldn't wait until they arrived in Texas. Sung Ho moaned in his sleep, shuffling uncomfortably. She brushed his hair from his eyes and thought she'd felt warmth on his forehead. She couldn't help but feel like they'd both just suffered a nightmare. She gripped his hand and waited for the bad dream to pass. The train jostled and blasted its horn. Much to her surprise, her son didn't wake. He didn't even stir. Out the window, she saw scattered trees. Judging by the descent of speed, they were approaching another station. More than anything, she wanted to wake Sung Ho and get off the train. But they were still a long way from Texas. Although no one entered her car, the luggage clattered on board. Their voices carried through the automatic door. The windows did nothing to muffle the sounds from the platform. There were fewer people, probably because of the night. Their tired faces reflected her own. If she'd had more energy, she might have given them backstories or observed their belongings to guess at what they did for a living. Her mind had grown too tired for that. The fight to keep her eyelids open intensified. The train blasted its horn again, and it chugged to life. The people on the platform disappeared, giving way to more trees. Occasionally, they'd let up, and she'd see an intersection with a car or two or a handful of buildings. Otherwise, it remained the same. The door whirred open again, and the ticket man stepped in. He looked at all the passengers as he passed by, but said nothing. She didn't like him, didn't trust him. As he passed, a smile curled from his lips, nothing more than a courtesy. Even that sent a chill up her spine. Her eyelids had grown heavy, and she longed for sleep, 
but that lingering fear kept her awake. If she closed her eyes, Aryam feared horrible dreams awaited. She could already imagine them. Her mother was lying on the floor in a pool of blood, the passengers with their bodies slumped over in the seats, or worse, spread all over the floor. She imagined this thing spreading, infecting people by the millions. Also, she knew he'd be there. He would be waiting deep in the recessions of her dreams, lurking, wearing all black with a bird-like mask, tagging along with a cane. He would be there. The worst fear was that he'd never leave. Another station and tons of miles passed. She'd regained control of her elevated heart rate and clutched tightly to the hand of her sleeping son. Above what little she could see from craning her neck, showing a palette of brightly illuminated stars. They were beautiful. With his hand in hers, she felt as if the good within him balanced out the evil she imagined in the world. He could bring balance where the chemicals in her brain couldn't. Without him, she had no purpose, no reason to live. Darkness cast upon the train as they entered a long tunnel. Outside the window, she saw nothing but stone walls on both sides. A periodic lantern only lighted the walls outside. The ceiling lining had two strips of bulbs that barely illuminated the interior of the train. Ahead, the unseen hunk coughed. Not again. The door swished open, and the man came stumbling in. Thump, thump, tap. With the tip of the cane, he touched the unseen man. His leather-gloved hand raised to the mask, adjusted, and returned to his side. Thump, thump, tap. Aryam's heart pounded against the walls of her ribs. She leaned over, stealing a glance as the birdman stepped over the hunk who'd collapsed in the aisle. He'd prodded him with the cane again, poking at his sides. The man let out an exasperated wheeze followed by coughs that spewed blood onto the floor. Coughs sounded from the car behind her. Loud ones. There seemed to be a lot of them. The man must have heard them because he moved again. Thump, thump, tap. She ducked behind the seat, hoping he wouldn't see her. A wet, obnoxious cough came from beside her. Her eyes grew wide in disbelief as she turned and looked at Sung Ho. His face had gone pale and his eyes dark. Sweat stood out on his forehead. In the pits of his shirt, she saw stains probably caused by a fever. With a finger pressed to her lips, she silenced him. More than the illness itself, she feared he would come for them. With her eyes, she pleaded for his silence begged for it. Maneuvering around the seat, she stole another glance at the front of the car. The man in black moved on to the beautiful blonde, who'd slumped over with her head dangling from the armrest. He pushed her head with his cane, earning a sickly groan. A whimper escaped her lips. Her hand reached to cover her mouth, but it was too late. The man in black looked up at her. His footsteps thudded against the aisle, gaining in speed and volume. Thump, thump, tap. There wasn't anywhere to run. Again, she closed her eyes. She prayed. Her eyelids clenched together as she chanted, Don't be real. Don't be real. For a long time, she didn't dare open them. She imagined he was standing there, close to her face, waiting to scare her. When she opened them, he wasn't there. The man wasn't lying on the floor, and the woman wasn't dangling from the armrest either. The fear of those delusions grew. It seemed that each time she imagined him, 
he got closer. At her side, Sung Ho looked fine. He jostled in his sleep again. He remained asleep, and his breath had fogged the window just a little more. As desperately as she could, she clung to reality. If she allowed her imagination to trail, things would get worse. Aryam didn't know exactly what would happen if he reached her, if anything at all. But she didn't want to find out. Luckily, the man across the aisle had closed his eyes. Otherwise, he'd have witnessed her panic and call the police. Then they'd find her and drag her back there. Within those walls, she wasn't allowed to see Sung Ho. They made sure of it. After talking herself off the ledge, an ounce of comfort came over her. She knew that the hallucinations wouldn't go on forever. If she needed them to go away badly enough, she could always use the safety net. I'm just going to rest my eyes. She leaned back in her chair and pushed the horrendous thoughts from her mind. The fear that he'd return tortured her. A distant fear that he might be lurking in her dreams also swept over her. She listened carefully for his footsteps, but heard little over the clanging train. The man wasn't real. Of that, she was certain. But she knew her imagination could be her worst enemy. She could imagine all sorts of horrific scenarios, and they regularly felt indistinguishable from reality. As a young girl, that imagination had been her best friend. Before she grasped English, she'd had no friends except those in her head. A light sleep came over her, but no nightmares waited. A couple of hours passed, and her eyes opened to the orange glow breaking on the horizon. With the sun came a sense of ease. Less bad things happened in the daylight. Much to her surprise, Sung Ho was already awake. He'd taken her hand in his and sat staring out the window, as he'd done before. He too looked mesmerized by the sunrise. The balloon drifted above his head, forgotten. A gurgling erupted in her stomach. The hot dogs had long since burned off, and she was hungry again. There had been a cafe car somewhere on the train, and she wondered if she could find it. As she shuffled through her pockets, she concluded there wasn't enough money. They'd have to wait. Sung Ho kicked his feet back and forth off the edge of his seat. This made her smile. Much like she'd done with English, she studied him carefully. With a boy as painfully shy as him, she'd learned to pick up on his body language. That little nap did nothing to repair the exhaustion from the trip, but she knew they'd sleep when they got there. The brakes screeched again, followed by the blare of the horn. Ahead was another train station. Outside, she watched as people walked freely about the city. They looked happy. Most of them. The train hissed as it came to a stop, and she saw them on the platform, waiting to board. Thump, thump, tap. As if in slow motion, the door sprung open. People started to board the train. He stood at the front of her car, hanging onto his cane, watching her. His hands rested on the brass notch on top of the cane. She looked out the window to her right, down at the platform. The people waiting in line had changed. Starbucks cups weren't gripped firmly in their hands anymore. They weren't happy morning people on their commute. The flesh around their mouths had split and dangled. The skin hung loosely from their bones like lepers. An emotionless, peeling mask had replaced the life that had once shone from their faces. These people brushed past the man in black as they boarded. With them came the pungent odor of death. Their feet dragged as they crept towards their seats, 
Maggots squirmed within the gaping holes of their skin as parts of their bones and organs shone through the various wounds. Sung Ho's hand overlapped hers. She turned and looked at him. His eyes left hers for a second, stealing a glance over the seat. She suspected he was looking at the man in black. The boy's face turned into a grimace. If you take your medicine, the monsters will go away. The train jerked to life. Its powerful engine chugged. The lump in her pocket reminded her of the way out, but she didn't think she needed it. She firmly believed she could hold on a little longer. Sung Ho squeezed her hand tighter, encouraging her. Again, she shook her head. Why not? With trembling hands, Aryam wiped away tears. If I take them, you'll go away too. I woke up shivering. A thick layer of sweat coated my body like an oily second skin, stretching over muscles tighter than a clenched fist. The memory of the nightmare that had reduced me to this state had already slipped from my grasp. All I could remember were odd silhouettes flitting about in the darkness. It must have been horrifying, though, or else my heart wouldn't be beating against my chest with such tremendous force. The ceiling fan whirled slowly above me, letting out the odd creak as it struggled to cool my body down. Beyond time I fixed that thing, I thought as I sucked in a couple of deep breaths to calm my heartbeat before turning my neck sideways to work out the tension knots in my shoulders. Raindrops drummed against the glass window on the wall to my right. I checked my phone. 1.45 a.m. It was drizzling, like it had been all throughout the day, and the angry, swollen clouds that had blotted out the sun and tarnished the sky mackerel gray were still refusing to release the pressure pent up inside them. The shit weather had forced me to stay home, even made me cancel my scheduled visit to the grocery store. However, the torrential rain I feared just never came. I swung my legs and rolled out of bed, furiously blinking as my vision shrank behind what looked like a swarm of glittering diamonds. The fact that a sudden movement was all it took to make me see stars was but a humiliating reminder of my advancing age. Rolling my shoulders, I stepped towards the window. A fresh scent of moist wood and wet mud wafted towards me through the gaps in the window frame. The sky was pitch black. No fishhook moon, no stars, no flashing lights of passing aircrafts. Nothing. Just dark clouds that grumbled and wept at the earth. My eyes drifted downwards towards the dark red brick wall and the painted sash window of my son's bedroom, down to the floor-to-ceiling glass of the living room, then onto the cobblestone pathway that led to the small iron gate at the edge of the property. A solitary street lamp shed a wash of yellow light at the wet metal of the gate, making it gleam. A hooded figure stood next to it. My heart leapt. He was standing with his back towards me, facing the gate. He was inside the property. Motionless, head bowed, he seemed to stare at the gate as water flowed down the folds of his coat dripping onto the ground below. I felt a sudden tightening in my chest. What was he doing here? Was he lost? In need of help? A neglected Alzheimer's patient? Didn't look like it. Didn't feel like it. I couldn't see him, but something about him, his straight posture, his broad shoulders, made me think he wasn't elderly. What else? Was he a home invader? Then why was he just standing there? The lack of active malice in his presence made me all the more unnerved. 
There was a certain wrongness about this man that I just couldn't put my finger on. I deliberated, calling the cops, to tell them what exactly. I shook my head. No, there was no need to escalate things to such an extent. I would look really foolish if this all turned out to be a misunderstanding. Yeah, better to try and talk to this man. After all, if at any point I felt like I was in danger, I could always just run back, slam the door shut, and call the police like I'd been intending to all along. Of course, no need to be scared. The decision filled me with a shaky confidence that made my scalp tingle. I turned around, grabbed my phone off the bed, and marched out of the room, my breath trembling with nervous excitement. The rain sounded louder in the hallway outside my bedroom as it pattered on the skylight. Moonlight would usually filter in through the broad glass panel adorning the sloping section of the cement roof. But not tonight, though. The water splashed and spilled on the dark, almost opaque glass. I shot a glance at my son's room. The door was open, heavy blue curtains pulled to the side. He was sound asleep on his large bed his body as oddly contorted as it usually gets when he's sleeping. I moved to the stairwell. Grabbing the polished handrail, I began my descent, wincing as the steps bent and creaked under my weight. Why was I so nervous? It was almost as if I was afraid of the man outside knowing that I was approaching him. It was ridiculous. I was going out to try to talk to him anyway, wasn't I? so why wouldn't I want him to notice me? Besides, there's no way he could possibly hear me from all the way out there, right? A flash of lightning lit up the stairwell, threw my shadow on the wall in front of me, a shadow that twitched. I gasped, swooned at the sudden fright. My fingers tightened around the wooden handrail as I cursed myself for being so jumpy. Thunder rumbled in the distance as I continued climbing down the stairs, hastening at the last three steps. Ahead of me was the front door, two long windows fixed to its sides. Thin white curtains were draped over the windows, obscuring the view outside. I considered switching the lights on, but then decided against it. Something about the lights splashing out of the windows and alerting the man outside that I was here scared me. I rushed forward, calves tense, head locked straight, eyes fixed on the door. Shadows pooled around the furniture in the living room to my left, but I dared not risk a peek. The prospect of seeing something that shouldn't be there was too frightening to consider. I jolted to a halt about a hair's breadth away from the door, almost crashing into it. That would have hurt, and made a lot of noise noise that the man outside would stop that. I gently rested my head against the door, felt the cool wood on my skin. My heart was racing in my chest. When was the last time I had been this terrified? All because of a strange man in a black coat standing with his back to the house? I felt my bones shiver as the image of that man, standing in the rain, flashed through my head. Was he still there? All I had to do was open the door and I'd know. I had been so full of confidence back up in my room, but now that I was actually here, with just a thin wooden door between the two of us, all courage had fled from my body. The thought of going closer to him filled my heart with an irrational dread. Why was I doing this at all? What was the point in trying to talk to him? He wasn't exactly a threat, right? He was just standing there, minding his own business. On my property. I balled my hand up into a fist, brought it up to my mouth, bit the knuckles. Then, exhaled. Right. He was on my property, but he wasn't doing anything, was he? What was the point in messing with him? It seemed far more reasonable to forget about all this and go back to bed. Whatever it was, I was sure it would be over in the morning. 
Things that went bump in the night dissipated like the fog under the warm rays of the sun, didn't they? Fuck. I couldn't. I just couldn't. I had to at least see whether he was still there or not, or else the thought would keep niggling at the back of my mind like a pebble stuck in a shoe. Tentatively, I reached for the white curtain drawn over the window to my left. I pulled it aside, craned my neck, and looked outside. The glass was speckled with raindrops, and it was dark out in the lawn, with the only source of light being the street lamp. But it was enough. He wasn't there anymore. Relief flooded through my body, warming it up. I forced myself to chuckle. How foolish had I been to be so scared of phantoms in the dark? It was like I was eight years old again, reduced to whimpers by the thought of something hiding under the bed, scratching the wooden slats with its long fingernails. <laughs> Ridiculous. Then, almost as if to reassert my dominance as the master of the house, I unlocked the door, pulled it open, and he was there, right at the threshold of the door, mere inches from my face. His head was bowed like he was looking at his boots. Tangles of matted, seaweed-like hair burst out of the hood of his coat and fell down the sides of his face, a face that was old, wrinkled, with numerous folds of skin drooping and festooning his jowls. He was still, breathless, smelled like the dead things that rot at the bottom of the sea. I slammed the door shut, made sure every lock in the damn thing was in place. My heart pounded in my chest, sending blood pumping through my body. My cheeks burned with fear as a knot swelled up in my throat. Alarm bells were ringing deafeningly loud in my head, an animalistic instinct that was warning me that my very survival was at stake. What the fuck? This was too much. I had to call the cops. My hands shook as I tried to unlock my phone. My fingers, oily with sweat, slipped on the screen. After a couple of tense seconds, it flared to life. I punched the numbers in and waited for the call to connect, risked another peek outside through the window. I couldn't see him from that angle. There wasn't enough light, and he had been standing too close to the door. Too fucking close. A shudder ran through me. What the fuck was he even doing? Drip. 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 I strained my ears. That sound... It was coming from somewhere close to me. Dripping water, louder and closer than what I'd been hearing until then. Droplets dripping on the floor. Wooden floor. Tears of horror and helplessness pricked my eyes. He was inside the house. Taking a measured step back, I turned my neck. Slowly, ever so slowly not wanting to materialize my fear by looking at it. My blood froze as my eyes drifted over the unlit space to my left. I didn't even have to use my phone's flashlight. The living room was illuminated by enough traces of moonlight to outline the silhouette of the man standing behind the hand-carved sofa. I stumbled, hit my back against the wall. Drip, drip, drip. I had heard about people becoming paralyzed after coming face to face with a predator in the forest. Never quite understood how or why that happened until that moment. An intense primal terror washed over me, seeped into my very bones. I wanted to run, to shout, but my body just wouldn't obey my desperate commands. For a couple of unimaginably long moments, I stood rooted to the spot, just staring at the black silhouette of the man. And then there was a sharp intake of breath. It was hoarse, raspy, like it was pulled through a wet plastic sheet jammed into a tight throat before being stuffed into lungs full of holes. My body shivered, my knees turning so weak I was afraid I'd collapse right there. 
but the spell was broken. I could move again, and move I did. I bolted toward the stairs, my bare feet thudding on the hardwood floor. I could hear him following me, squishing of wet shoes, splashing of water on the floor, rustling of the moisture-laden coat. I jumped two steps at a time, doing my hardest to increase the distance between us. The man's shadow loomed large on the wall, letting me know that I wasn't quite succeeding. Three steps away from the landing on the first floor, I faltered. My foot, instead of finding hard wood, sank into darkness, and I fell face first, my skull making a sickening crack as it bounced on the handrail before my flailing hands inadvertently and thankfully cushioned it down to the floor. Needles of sharp pain stabbed my head, only to be overwhelmed by the burning agony in my twisted right foot. The man's footsteps boomed like gunshots on the stairs behind me. I bit my cheek and reached for the vertical iron bars supporting the handrail. My hands wrapped tight around the cold metal as I began pulling myself up. The movement intensified the pain in my leg, causing tears to stream down my face. Yet, with gritted teeth and strained arm muscles, I kept on heaving myself up. My stomach turned in knots in anticipation. Any second, I was going to feel cold and clammy hands on my injured leg. Any second, I was going to be yanked back into the darkness. How terrified would my son be by my screams? The poor boy wasn't even aware of what was inside the house. I crawled onto the landing, sucking in deep breaths as I leaned against the banister. The footsteps behind me abruptly ended. Did he stop? The rank stench that clung to his body like grease seemed to dissipate. I pushed myself up on my elbows, shifted my body to scan the stairwell. It was empty, like he had never even been there. I squeezed my eyes shut and groaned in frustration. Fuck, where was he now? I couldn't see him anywhere. Not wanting to waste this momentary lull and the mind-numbing terror, I took the support of the banister and hoisted myself up on my feet gnashing my teeth to fight through the pain. I shifted my whole weight onto my good leg and began hobbling towards my room. A flash of lightning sliced through the darkness. I saw it, for the briefest of seconds, out of the corner of my eye. He was there, outside the house, lying face down on the skylight. The footsteps started up again, the smell returned, thicker than ever, clogging my nostrils like a rotting corpse. How? How could he be in two places at once? I darted towards my bedroom, unmindful of the pain making my entire body throb, and slammed the door shut behind me, knowing that the act was pretty much useless. He could appear inside my room whenever he wished it, tear me apart limb from limb. Sweat erupted out of my pores. It was hopeless, utterly hopeless. I bawled like a baby, my chest quaking with the sobs. A faint voice out in the hallway wrenched me out of my self-pity. Dad? The footsteps of the man continued, getting closer and closer. Dad, are you okay? No, 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 no. Dad, where are you? Get back inside. The footsteps were right outside my room now. Hey, what are you doing up so late at night? That's not me. That's not me. The footsteps picked up speed, drifted away from my room. My son let out a sharp gasp. My heart sank in my chest. Then, the screams. Loud and shrill, full of fear, confusion, and pain. 
buried beneath them, the vile sounds of breaking bones and blood spurting out of torn vessels. My mind was a mess. Guilt, fear, shame warred endlessly. I should have done something, rushed out of the room to try and protect my son, but I couldn't, because above all else, there was relief in my heart, relief that he chose my son and not me. Hey, man, I'm like Robin Hood. I rob from the rich and give to the poor. Except replace rich with stupid and poor with me. Same difference. Doesn't do me any good to kill my clients. Then where does the money come from? Think about it. So you're declining a lawyer and sticking to your story? I don't need to stick to my story, officer. It's all on film, you'll see. Okay, Mr. Lama, so tell me about your business. You don't need to say it in that tone of voice. I had, have, principles, man. I never worked someone who actually believed in that crap. But believe me, that didn't narrow down the field much. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Most people hold to that old Fox Mulder bit, I want to believe. People's lives get so boring, so banal, that they're willing to jump over any bandwagon to feel like they're part of something big. I'm just helping it all along is all. Helping. Don't condescend me. I know my rights. What I do is no worse than what those bullshit peddlers on cable TV do every time, they regurgitate that alien abduction crap. But they have the illusion of authority because they're on TV, so it's okay. Fuck them. If people want to be sold a fantasy, why not? It's not my fault people died. I was just in it for the bottom line. It's not my fault, I swear. So you're saying you have something against... The cable TV people. Oh, no, no, you don't. Weren't you listening? It wasn't my fault. How so? Did they make you do it? Come on, dude, I'm not crazy. I know I look like it wearing this thing, but... Can I change, man? I feel like a dick. You have to understand how this looks. You go complaining about these people. Fuck them, in your words. Less than an hour after you're found standing over a dead TV crew. You're going to have to do better than that. Maybe I do want a lawyer. Can I just change? The suit is itchy. Maybe later, if you tell us what you did with her organs. Here begins the preliminary hearing in the state v. Charles Lama. Defense. Are you prepared to give testimony? Yes, Your Honor, but let it be on the record that this testimony is given against the advice of counsel, pending psychological evaluation at least. Duly noted, defense. Mr. Lamar, you may begin. Don't worry, man. I'll get you back to your public defender cubicle before lunch, okay? So, I don't know what those cops told you, Judge, but this is all true, I swear. It's the idea, Mr. Lamer. I know, Judge, just saying. So, here it goes. I got the first email three Mondays ago. I thought it was spam at first, but apparently they expected that, so they sent another on Tuesday. ETTV, some documentary show. Stupid name, I know. That's why I thought it was a scam. I don't like to give in to scams, but it looked legit enough, and the possibility of being on TV was worth the risk. So I bid. They first had me speak to the skeptic. Every show has one. You know, that jackass who drops the word science twice per show? 
then grudgingly agrees that the blurry frisbee photos might actually be UFOs? That guy. His name was Keith Fry, Mr. Lummer, and I thank you to watch your language in the courtroom. Sorry, Judge. Yeah, Keith. And I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but most of you call me worse than a jack bad name when I'm not in the room, right? Well, they're no different. We're not here to discuss your alien investigation business. Mr. Lammer, please continue. Sure, Your Honor. Next, I spoke to the lead host and the producer. I could kind of tell that the producer was in on it, got the grift. But Noreen, the lead investigator, was a true believer. Surprised me, to be honest, but uh, whatever. I guess that's when I first came up with the idea for the costume. Anyway, they wanted to come follow me on an investigation, so we set up the time and place. I had just got a new client, an abductee from out near Arco, way out in the boonies. Perfect setup. I called John Sharkey after that. We'd worked together before. He was in a motorcycle accident when he was a teenager and had that steel plate in his head. He'd used this shtick about being able to pick up on alien transmissions. Pretty brilliant, really. Anyway, I called him because he needed an accomplice on a job this big. Your Honor, he admits to contacting an accomplice. Do we really need to hear... Okay, calm your tits, leech. Wrong choice of words. I'm a lawyer, Mr. Lommer, not a leech. So tell us, was this before or after you give your accomplice a black eye? Certainly before you eviscerated him. Hey, Judge, can you shut this guy up? Aren't I supposed to be telling my story here? The court requests the prosecution to refrain from asking questions until the formal statement is given. Sorry, Your Honor. Damn strangers, sorry. Mr. Lammer. Um, right. So, Sharky says, I should just let it play out. He says that we'll just go along with our routine and let the film crew fill in the rest. Those investigations never turn up anything anyway. Might ruin the fun if they actually did. I had a better idea, though. I was going to play it up big. Give him something to show. I should have just taken the 15 minutes of fame and parlayed that into a few extra jobs. But I had to be a showman. Stupid. So I went and got the suit. The alien costume? It cost a lot, but I thought it'd be worth it. I guess it was, in a sense. Right? Anyway, the plan was pretty simple. I was going to have Jack wear the suit and just run around in the alfalfa fields during the shoot. That was it. I wouldn't even pretend to see him. I'd just let them find it in the footage during the editing. Easy breezy. Except Jack pussied out and didn't want to do it. He said the alfalfa wasn't tall enough in case he had to hide and that he'd feel like an idiot if we were caught. Plus, he said he felt bad. I guess I should say that for the record. He had an attack of conscience, for whatever that's worth. I saw the guy try to convince a widow that he was channeling her dead husband and wanted a handy, so I don't know how honorable he was, but whatever. It's on the record. Put it in on the old bit. So I decided I'd just do the alien thing myself. The suit fit, I'd slip away, get dressed, and stand in the background of a few shots. I had a laser pointer, which would pick up upon infrared really well. It was a lock. So they would show up the next day in three vans. Three. On TV, you see one van with all four idiots and their gear crammed inside. But they've got three vans and almost a dozen crew. They're already getting B-roll of themselves babbling on walkie-talkies from ten feet away from each other. They go to a lot of trouble to make that show look less professional than it is. I'd kill for that kind of production, though. Damn it. 
Poor choice words again. Hey, stop smirking, Leech. I can hear what you're thinking. Just stop it. It's a turn of phrase, all right? We're all familiar with figures of speech, Mr. Lommer. Just stick to the story, please. Yes, Your Honor. When you think of it, it's kind of their own fault. If they hadn't brought so many people, then there would have been fewer bodies. Maybe I could have saved more of them, or some of them, or one of them, whatever. So everything's going good. We wait until dark for some reason. The four idiots strap cameras all over themselves and start running around and whispering like the aliens couldn't hear them if they did. Mr. Lommer? Mr. Lommer, is everything all right? Um, uh, yeah, Your Honor, I was just thinking. Were they listening? Are they now? Mr. Lommer, please focus. Right, the story. i got to tell the story. Okay, so they strap on these cameras, including the ones pointed right at their faces. How stupid is that? How does that help? Anyway, immediately Noreen starts running around and screaming like she's got a rat in her panties. I was pretty alarmed at first, but then I noticed that no one else is giving a shit. Like she's just hamming it up, which she was. I didn't notice then that one of the crew camera guys, named Darren, I guess, wasn't moving at all. Like, not just not reacting, but straight up not moving, frozen. The guy was paralyzed. I noticed it later because he didn't move from that spot when it all went down. I guess everyone else was too focused on their own stuff to notice. They didn't notice the blue light pointing at Darren either. Probably thought it was the moon. I did too, but now I know better. Anyway, I take the opportunity to sneak out and do a wardrobe change. I slip into the barn and get into the suit. I underestimated how long it was going to take, and by the time I dressed, I noticed that someone had turned up the blue light outside. Or that's what I thought, like they'd brought a floodlight for some reason. It was a cold blue. And by that, I don't mean the color was cold blue. I mean it gave off cold like fire gives off heat. It was cold. Real eerie, too. The light came through the slats in the barn walls and made everything look real strange. And did I say cold? I thought it was probably just a breeze or something. Either way, a floodlight was no good for my plans. So I stay put and peek out of the barn to see what's up. First thing I notice is that there's a lot more people outside than there were before. Then I notice that half the people weren't moving. The ones that did were tall and lanky, big heads. I think you see where I'm going here? Your Honor, are we going to stand here and let this man blame a, a dozen murders on aliens? Be seated, prosecution. Go on, Mr. Lommer. But be warned, this proceeding is not one of your jobs. We won't have any showmanship here. Uh, not at all, Your Honor. Like I said, this was all legit. They were here. They were... I'm not saying they were aliens. Just that they weren't human. And that they had big heads and black eyes. And that they looked like aliens. Okay, they were they're probably aliens. Doesn't matter. What matters is what they did next. I look out and see them lift up some weird instruments in their hands. Bright red lights pop up on the end of them like lasers... And they start, they start cutting people up. They cut them right the fuck open, Your Honor. Guts and all. They cut off Darren's arm. The people didn't move. They didn't do anything. They didn't scream or bleed or even fall over. They just stood there as the aliens poked and passed around body parts like they were shopping for the ripest avocado. At first, I thought it was all somehow part of the show, like they'd beat me to the punch or something. Season finale, maybe, you know? But it was startling anyway, so I straightened up real quick. 
When I did, I bumped into something behind me. Now, keep in mind that I'm still in my alien suit, okay? So I freak out a little and spin around, and what do you know? There's a big old fucking alien right next to me, looking down at me. I got one of those glowing tools pointed at me, but the light's not on. For some reason, I don't know why, I freaked out and pointed my laser pointer at it, like right in its face, and wiggled it around a little. I guess I thought maybe it'd get distracted like a cat. Hey, stop laughing. I was panicking, okay? Anyway, it got this look that is pretty universal for annoyance, and swatted a little laser away like a fly. Then it gives me this real stupid look. It's staring at me like it knows something's wrong. Like I'm the ugliest alien it ever saw. I think the jig was up until I hear someone start screaming from outside. I knew the voice immediately. It was Sharky in his steel plate, God bless him, wailing like a banshee and chagrin full bore across the alfalfa field. I guess whatever that blue light was couldn't get through that chrome dome of his, so he made a break for it. Say what you will, but I'll be wearing a tinfoil hat for the rest of my days. Even if you throw me in jail, I'll blow the biggest dude for some Reynolds wrap. What's the tinfoil to cigarette exchange right nowadays? Don't worry, I'll let you know. Mr. Lommer. Uh, sorry. Anyway, they, the aliens, all go after Sharky running on foot. He doesn't make it 20 yards, and one of them almost catches up. He shucks and jives, but it ain't enough. The blue light kind of drifts over to them, and then aliens have him corralled into the center of it. I can tell that he's getting dozy, kind of acting drunk, but he doesn't go out. He just keeps stumbling around until, I guess, one of them gets fed up with it and just cocks him right upside the head. Get that? All that advanced technology and this gangly gray fella just slugs Jack Sharkey into a coma. High fucking intelligence, right? Anyway, I fumbled out my cell phone and called the cops. It's a little staticky, but it works. They say they'll be there in a hurry, but it wasn't a hurry enough. The things got Jack Sharkey's intestines spilled all over the dirt and are fishing around inside them like they lost their keys. I can smell the vomit in my mask, even though I didn't throw up till later. I was pretty freaked out. But it wasn't until they got to Noreen that I grabbed my sack and did something useful. Good-looking, true-believing Noreen. Her job was to act like a leader and scream a lot. All she wanted was answers, just like the rest of us. But somehow, she got sucked into this shitty line of work. Welcome to the club, Noreen. Rest in peace. She was still in the yard, paralyzed, staring into a pair of binoculars looking right at the blue light. If she had her eyes open, she was probably blind by then. It was bright. I suppose it was coming from a UFO, but I couldn't see it. Anyway, one of them is going toward her with its red thing, and I guess I decided I had to be a hero. There was a steel bucket and a shovel. I put the bucket on my head, or rather on the alien head. If it were my head, it would have blocked my view but it fit on the alien pretty well. Then I grabbed the shovel and ran for it before my wits gave out. I was still too slow. They had her organs, I don't know which ones, I'm not a doctor, in their hands by the time I got there. So, too late to be a hero, right? I could still score one for revenge, I thought. The blue light made me woozy, and I knew what Sharky must have been feeling, but... I stayed with it, being the big one right in the face. It was hard to hold on to the shovel because I was wearing rubber gloves with a suit, and the fingers were like 
four inches of floppy rubber longer than my fingers. What I'm trying to say is that I didn't have a good grip. The shovel kind of tonged and kind of splatted into the thing's face, but it only stepped back a little. Then it looked at me, confused. Another one of them took the shovel and looked at it with a weird amount of interest. Just plucked it right from my hands. Then one went to take the bucket off my head. I tried to stop it, but remember the gloves? So here I am, flopping my big rubber fingers in its face, when the blue light gets into my head, and I... uh, the world starts going black. I was fully in fright mode, though. High octane. Hey, stop laughing, leech. Yeah, I pissed the suit. It was adrenaline, not fear. Big deal. Anyway, the blue light suddenly shuts off, and all the aliens are gone. Just like that, it's over. Except it's not. Suddenly, everyone starts screaming for a real brief moment. They woke up, see? Half their organs were gone. The aliens took them. Still keeps me up at night. Didn't last long, though. How could it? Next thing I know, the place are rolling up to the farm and I'm being cuffed. I guess that's why they left. Because the police were coming. Saved by the bell, right? It's quite the story, Mr. Lama. Yes, it is, Leech. And it's all true. How long have you been working in this field, Lama? Almost 20 years. And in that time, have you ever heard of anyone being killed by aliens like this? No. But look up cattle mutilations and you'll see some pretty startling similarities. Yes, but people. Have you ever heard of people being mutilated? No, not necessarily. Have you heard of abductees? Reporting surgical procedures aboard alien crafts? Yeah. Do you recall any of them coming back without organs? Or body parts of any sort, for that matter? No. So? So, Mr. Lama, isn't it a trope of the field that aliens always reattach severed limbs, replace organs, mend cuts, and the like? I suppose so. What are you saying? I'm saying, isn't it possible that you should have minded your own damn business and just let events take course? Isn't it possible that aliens traveling 12.4 light years across deep space aren't stupid enough to leave a bunch of dead humans lying around? Isn't it possible that you shouldn't go smacking people in the face with shovels because it really fucking hurts? Or maybe it's possible, no, probable, that you're going to take the rap for this and admit that you took revenge on the TV crew for butting in on your own professional territory. Hey, that's bullshit, you know it. Do you really think? No, it's not my fault. So you say... Come on, Judge, you hearing this? Since when did we get to the examination portion of the tri... Judge? Judge? You okay? Bailiff, hey, why aren't they moving? Leech, what's going on, man? I don't know. Mr. Lama, do you understand? That light. Judge, wake up. It's that light. A simple question, Mr. Lama. Do you understand the benefits of confessing your crime? The video! I'll just show him the video! The video is gone. The organs are in the trunk of your car. Things are looking grim. Do you understand? Or we can always make other arrangements. I've got a shovel in my car. No, 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 I get it. Whatever the fuck you are, I get it. Good. Your Honor, I believe the witness has something further to add. 
Um, what's that now? Mr. Lommer, are you finished? No, Your Honor. I guess I got more to say. Fog shrouded the old suspension footbridge crossing the ravine. Visibility stretched to only 20 feet in any direction, magnifying the isolation Dakota Storm already felt. The muffled sound of water rushing over rocks and boulders 75 feet below could be heard. Otherwise, the world remained silent. He felt his heart pound as he stared at the bridge whose length disappeared into the mist. His determination, built since the accident, waned as he approached the steel cabling securing the bridge's expanse. Doubts about his decision crept into his conscience. Is this what I really want? Pain and guilt consumed his every waking moment. He needed an escape, but was this the coward's way out? He did not know the answer, nor did he care. All he knew was his wife and three-year-old son were gone forever, killed in a senseless car accident caused by a drunk driver. The thought of spending another Christmas without them gave him a painful, hollow feeling. The image of his wife on their wedding day came to him as he closed his eyes. Her white dress and the crown of white statusy and lavender remained as vivid in his memory as the day she wore them. But now, two years since the incident, the image resembled a picture rather than a real person. He could only remember his son's face if he focused on a photograph. His guilt deepened as his memory faded. Grasping the steel cable, he stood still for what seemed like forever. The wooden planks under his feet darkened as dusk settled over the park. He put one foot on the bridge and heard it creak. Through the gloom created by the fog, a sound of whimpering could be heard. He stopped and concentrated on the noise. Tilting his head toward the sound, it grew in intensity. As an ex-military dog handler, he knew the tone of an injured canine. On instinct, he yelled, Where are you, boy? From the depths of the mist surrounding the bridge came a series of desperate barks. His original purpose for being at the bridge vanished as he rushed toward the sound of a wounded animal. Halfway across the creaky, swaying bridge, he could discern the shape of a medium-sized dog tied to one of the bridge planks. As he approached, the dog barked, then bared its teeth in a snarl. Storm steadied himself, holding on to the top cable of the bridge as it swayed from his movement. What's wrong, boy? His voice remained calm and soothing as he walked slowly toward the animal. Are you caught? Staring at the approaching man, the canine stopped barking, dipped its head and whimpered. Storm kneeled a foot away from the dog's closest reach and spoke in a gentle voice. You're a pretty one. As he spoke, he searched for the spot where the dog was tied. It appeared to be a leash or rope entangled in amongst the wooden planks of the bridge. The trapped border collie displayed the standard black and white coat. Its bright eyes revealed the full intelligence of the breed. He sat in front of the dog, crossed his legs, and started talking to the animal. What he said mattered not. Using a calm, soothing voice did. From its appearance, the dog had been trapped for a while. The hair was soaked and matted, but the ears pointed up while the tail wagged with anticipation. Storm could see a choker collar, used for training, attached to the leash. On closer inspection, it appeared to be adjusted to keep the animal from escaping. As darkness descended, he made an attempt to touch the dog. To his surprise, it allowed his hand to pat its head. The more he talked, the calmer the canine grew. Taking a leap of faith, he untangled the leash. Let's get off this bridge and get you something to eat. Without hesitation, it followed. Four hours later, with the animal fed, watered, and bathed, clumps of matted hair littered the bottom of the bathtub after trimming them while he brushed. The dog now slept on a blanket next to his bed as he searched several websites for any news of a missing border collie in the surrounding area. The search proved fruitless. Sitting back against the headboard, he watched the dog's chest rise and fall. How could anyone abandon such a beautiful creature? The dog raised its head to look at Storm, his tail occasionally thumping the floor. He knew the canine was incapable of smiling, but it sure looked like one. What am I going to call you, boy? The collie's tail thumped the floor harder. What about Apollo? 
the Greek god of light and healing? The speed of the thumping increased twofold. Then Apollo it is. A new thought made him smile. Maybe God put you there. Maybe he put you there to give me another chance to see the light and possibly heal. St. Louis County, Missouri. December, one year later. Dakota Storm and Apollo entered the St. Louis County Sheriff's locker room 30 minutes before the start of their shift. As he placed his civilian clothes in his locker, someone behind him yelled, Hey Storm, Cap wants to see you in his office. Turning, Storm saw his shift commander, Brad Garrett, at the end of the locker row with his hands on his hips. Why? Garrett shrugged. Don't know, above my pay grade. All he said was for you to report as soon as you arrive. Got it. Thanks, Sarge. As he maneuvered his way through the locker room, Apollo stayed on his left side in perfect step as they approached Captain Guy McBride's office. When he arrived, he noticed the captain's door open. After knocking on the frame, he remained outside the room. Looking up, McBride smiled and waved him in. Shut the door, please. Storm's first thought was, Uh-oh, what have I done now? He stood at parade rest in front of the desk waiting for whatever chewing out might follow. Relax, Storm, have a seat. Complying, he lowered himself into one of the two wooden chairs in front of the ancient gray metal desk. McBride smiled, gathered the paperwork, tapped them on the surface to make a neat stack and placed it in his outbasket. He glanced at Apollo sitting to the left of Storm. The border collie panted. Its eyes glued to the captain while it sat ramrod street. Is that dog always by your side? His name is Apollo, sir. Yes, I know. You didn't answer the question. You wanted to see me, Captain? McBride chuckled. Like I said earlier, take it easy. You're not in trouble. The reason you're here is because I got an odd email this morning. Storm's posture relaxed slightly, but he kept his guard up. I take it the email concerned me? The captain nodded. The message also concerned Judy and your son. At the mention of their names, Storm stiffened again. What about them? The email was not specific, but there's an inmate at the Jefferson City Correction Center who is dying. His last wish is to talk to you about them. Who is he? Someone I arrested? A nod from McBride confirmed his statement. What's his name, Captain? Eli Burns. Do you remember him? Vaguely. Wasn't he part of a stolen car ring? Yeah, that's him. You were undercover and helped convict him. He's in the JCCC infirmary and dying from cancer. Reportedly, he only has a few days to live and wants to talk to you. Storm blinked several times. Not sure I want to talk to him. Don't blame you, but according to the warden's email this morning, he said he has information you need to know. I'm on duty for the next five days, sir. Not anymore. I want you to get out of your uniform and head to Jeff City when you're done. Am I on special assignment? As of five minutes ago. What do you think this is about, Captain? Don't know. Hopefully you'll know by the end of the day. JCCC rules did not allow canines into the facility, so Apollo stayed in the car. Being late fall with temperatures in the mid-50s, he was safe and comfortable in Storm's old Ford F-150. After showing identification as a St. Louis County deputy, he was escorted to the infirmary in a small room with one bed. The individual residing there appeared emaciated and barely alive. A male nurse attended to various tubes attached to the inmate's body. He looked up as Storm entered the room. Are you deputy Dakota Storm? A nod was his answer. The nurse touched the patient's shoulder. Eli? The man's eyes fluttered and he stared confused at the figure above him. Eli, the deputy you wanted to speak to is here. The man turned his head toward the door and saw Storm. Dull blue-gray eyes attempted to focus. The dark circles under them contrasted with the translucent skin and hairless head. The fluorescent light above the bed gave the man a ghostly appearance. With a croaky voice, he said, You, Storm? Yes. He raised his right hand with great effort and waved the deputy closer. 
Approaching the man's bedside, Storm thought he saw a small tear trickle down the inmate's face. In a voice barely above a whisper, he said, As you can probably tell, I'm dying. Storm's only response was to fold his arms. You already know that, so I'll be brief. The death of your wife and son wasn't an accident. They were killed on purpose. Tilting his head, Storm remained silent. The guy wasn't supposed to be drunk. He was paid to make it look like a one-vehicle accident. The world spun as Storm steadying himself with a hand on the wall next to him. What do you mean he was paid? The inmate shook his head and then a series of hacking coughs racked his body. The shock of the revelation gave Storm pause. He waited for the patient's spasms to settle down. When they did, he leaned over the bed. What do you mean he was paid? The infirmed man blinked rapidly for several seconds. Because... I was asked to supply the car. The plan was for him to run your wife's vehicle off the road, make it look like a hit and run. But he had had a few drinks and fucked up. He was headed in the wrong direction when he hit her car head on. Why are you telling me this? Through gritted teeth, he said, Because you need to know the truth and I can die in peace. I'm not a murderer, Storm. Right. There's a reason she was killed. I'm listening. It had to do with who she was. What are you talking about? She was Judy Storm. Burns shook his head. Her name wasn't Judy. The man stiffened with another bout of pain. He looked at his caregiver. The morphine is wearing off. Please. A nod from the nurse and then a syringe was inserted into the tube attached to the patient's left arm. As the chemicals flowed into the inmate's body, his demeanor changed and he relaxed. That's better. He looked at Storm. I don't know who she really was until I got here. Burns, you're not making any sense. Her name was Judy Thorne and I met her at a friend's birthday party. Her name wasn't Judy Thorne. What was it? The man shook his head. Don't know. Whose idea was it to kill her? I knew him as Gimpy. What kind of name is that? Nickname. No one used their real names in the group. He walked with a slight limp. Why was she targeted? Because she escaped. <coughs> The man shook with a coughing fit. His eyes closed as he gasped for breath. Storm looked at the nurse. It's the drugs. I have to use more each time to control his pain. Eventually, either the morphine or the cancer will kill him. Burns' eyes closed. Storm watched the man for several seconds, a long before he's conscious enough to talk again. A couple of hours, maybe more. Storm returned four hours later and was once again escorted to the infirmary room where two orderlies were cleaning. When he knocked on the doorframe, one turned. Deputy Storm? Yes, where's Burns? Passed away about 30 minutes ago. Storm took the scenic route back to his home in Chesterfield, Missouri. The two-hour drive from Jefferson City gave him time to think and talk with Apollo. His conversations with the dog were more thinking out loud sessions than true discussions. So far, since finding the Border Collie a year earlier, it had never offered an opinion, just unwavering loyalty. Thirty minutes into the drive, Storm glanced at the canine strapped into a dog seatbelt harness in the passenger seat, its keen eyes on the road ahead. What do you think, Apollo? The dog turned its head and started panting. Yeah, that's what I think. I don't know if I should believe the guy or not. Apollo kept his gaze on Storm, tongue out, and panting. He displayed the same look he did the night Storm and he first met, the appearance of a smile. Storm continued, Why would someone I vaguely remember drag me to Jeff City to tell me that Judy was really someone else? Apollo tilted his head slightly, but as was his habit, did not answer the question. That's just silly. 
When we were dating, she showed me the house she grew up in and we drove by the elementary school she attended. I saw her high school yearbook with all the notes her friends wrote in it. She even talked about her days in college and the guys she dated. He watched the road and lapsed into silence. Ten minutes later, he said, She never talked about her parents because they died when she was young. She lived with her aunt. He stopped. You know, Apollo, she and I never visited the aunt. I wonder if she's still alive. If she is, maybe we could find her? Apollo lay on the seat, his eyes closed. After a quick glance at his canine partner, Storm returned his attention to the road. I've never been through her personal papers. Just couldn't make myself do it. There has to be information within them that would help me find the ant. Glancing at Apollo again, he noticed his companion with one eye open looking at him. Thanks for the talk, buddy. I'm not sure I buy the old man's fantasy. The canine raised his head, yawned, shifted position, and closed his eyes. With a smile, Storm chuckled. Leave it to you to remind me to get back to reality. Two weeks before Christmas. With three years having passed since his wife and son's untimely death, Storm had not felt the need to trim his home for the holidays. Bringing the decorations into the house from the attic in the garage, he felt it time to move on and accept the fact they were gone. When he opened the first plastic tote, he almost stopped and took all of them back to the garage. Judy's favorite decorations were on the top. One of them was a music box depicting the manger scene. As tears formed in his eyes, he straightened and took a deep breath. He exhaled slowly. With renewed determination, he started arranging the items from the container around the house. To the best of his memory, he replicated how she decorated the rooms. In another storage box, he found the Christmas tree bulbs. As he rummaged around, he noticed a strange ornate jewelry container on the left side. Judy insisted each year that she and she alone would decorate the tree. Now he found something in the container he had never seen before. With trepidation, Storm lifted the box out and examined it. Apollo appeared by his side, having awoke from his morning nap. Looking up at his master, he proceeded to pant at his normal rate. Storm looked down. Should I open the box, Apollo? A small whimper came from the animal. Yeah, I think I should too. Storm studied the wooden box with intricate carvings on the top and sides. He found a latch and flipped it open. The contents amounted to a leather-bound journal. After a moment of hesitation, he lifted the book and opened it. His late wife's eloquent handwriting greeted him. My dearest Dakota, If you have found this journal, my past has caught up with me. For that I am sorry. I did not mean to fall in love with you, but did. You have made me happier than I ever thought possible. Plus, I was almost able to forget where I came from. I am currently pregnant with our son and hope the three of us can live in peace forever. But sometimes, the gods do not allow past transgressions to go unpunished. Within the pages of this journal, I have recorded information you will need to keep yourself and our son safe. I know I should have told you the truth from the beginning, but if you had known the facts, you would have walked away. Call it selfish, but I could not take the chance of losing you. Take care of yourself and our son, knowing my love for you will never die. Judy Storm read the passage with disbelief the first time and grudging acceptance by the third. He sat cross-legged on the floor next to the plastic tote. As he looked up from the journal, Apollo laid his head on his knee. His eyes seemed filled with sorrow, reflecting his owner's feelings. Placing a hand on the dog's head, he whispered, Holy shit, Apollo. Storm rapped on Shift Commander Garrett's doorframe. Garrett waved him in. What's on your mind, Storm? The deputy handed the man the journal. I found this in some of Judy's personal things I had not gone through. The sergeant hesitated to accept the book. Uh, not sure that's any of my business, Dakota. In reality, it is, sergeant. It outlines the structure of a criminal enterprise working out of both St. Louis and Memphis. The connections stretch all the way to Biloxi, Mississippi and New Orleans on the coast. Taking the journal in his hand, Garrett thumbed through the pages. Drugs? Yes, plus illegal guns and sex trafficking. Focusing on Storm, Garrett asked, Was Judy... No, sir. According to the journal, she escaped their clutches in her late teens and managed to start a new life. 
Setting the book down, Garrett said, Was she killed because she escaped? Storm shrugged. I don't know. That's my assumption. Pulling his arms, the sergeant tilted his head. Let me guess. You want to investigate all this? No, sir. Then why bring it to me? I'm requesting vacation time. To investigate it? No, to clear Judy's name. Same thing. Not really. He paused. Besides, I haven't used any of my vacation since the accident. I've got five weeks built up and believe it's time to take it. Garrett grew quiet as he focused on the tall man standing in front of his desk. All right, Storm. Vacation granted. Thank you. The deputy retrieved the journal and turned to go. Just before he exited the office, Garrett said, Dakota, if you run into trouble, call me. Turning, Storm gave the man a sad smile. Thanks, Brad. Two days later, Memphis, Tennessee. Christmas lights lit the night skyline of Memphis as Storm drove through the downtown area. Apollo sat next to him taking in the cheerful decorations. His destination? The industrial part of town between the airport and the Burlington Northern Santa Fe rail yards north of East Shelby Drive. According to Judy's journal, the warehouse he sought could be found on Malone Drive. Storm wore black jeans, long sleeved black layered insulated shirt, black New Balance athletic shoes, and a rolled up black balaclava. Apollo's white sections of his coat were dyed black with a canine safe coloring dye. The two would be invisible in the darkened recesses of the area they sought. Consulting the GPS unit on his phone, the vacationing deputy drove by the location looking for any signs of guards or security cameras. He saw no indication of physical sentries, but he did note the presence of numerous surveillance devices. Parking his Ford F-150 half a mile from the warehouse, Storm rolled down his balaclava. With his face covered, he grabbed his black backpack and exited the truck with Apollo hot on his heels. Keeping to the shadows far from the lights of the area, it took them 20 minutes to reach the rear entrance of the building. Remaining in the shadows, he extracted an exotic-looking gun from his backpack and aimed it at the security camera covering the rear entrance to the warehouse. The red paintball bullet splattered on the lens, effectively blinding it. He adjusted his aim and fired at another one. With both cameras disabled, he ran to the back door. Testing the knob, he determined it would be faster to use a crowbar. Not subtle, but effective. Fifteen seconds later, he and Apollo entered the building through the now open door. Kneeling beside the dog, he made a circling motion with his index finger and the canine took off into the interior of the structure. Visibility within the building came from numerous security lights. Before he could start his search, he heard Apollo yelp once. Storm rushed in the direction of the sound. He found the dog sniffing at a door that appeared to be the entrance to a separate section of the warehouse. Placing his ear against the door, he heard female voices pleading for help. By means of the same crowbar used on the back entrance, he jimmied the door open and was greeted to the sight of ten young girls. All appeared terrified. One brave soul asked, Who are you? Are you all okay? The same woman said, do we look okay? We're in a warehouse in the middle of who knows where with no food or water. How do you think we are? Abandoning his plans to search the warehouse, Storm said, If you want out, ask your questions later. Right now, follow me. He turned and used his flashlight to guide the ten girls out of the building. Thirty minutes later, police cars, ambulances, and fire trucks gathered around the warehouse. Female police officers attended to the young girls, who Storm learned, ranged in age from 14 to 18. All were runaways from Mississippi and Louisiana. A sergeant with the Memphis Police Department stood in front of Storm. Wow, we appreciate your help with finding and freeing these young ladies. What the hell were you doing in there? Following a tip, he showed the officer his St. Louis County Deputy Sheriff ID. You could have come to us first. I could have, but I didn't. I don't need to remind you about the number of laws you broke with your illegal entry into the building. No, you don't. But are you missing the fact that ten underage females were being held against their will inside? Did you also fail to recognize that they are probably part of a sex trafficking ring that extends from New Orleans to St. Louis? 
The tall officer looked at the group of girls and then back at Storm. He offered his hand. George Stevens. As Storm shook it, he said, Dakota Storm. He pointed to the border collie sitting next to him. That's Apollo. He's a certified canine officer. Okay, Storm. How did you learn about this? From an informant before they killed her. I have her notes. Stevens sighed. We knew something was off about this warehouse, but never could obtain enough evidence to get a search warrant. Storm did not answer. Another Memphis police officer walked up to Stevens and whispered in his ear. The sergeant's expression changed immediately and he said, You're not free to go yet, Storm. Stay put. I have something I need to take care of. He hurried away following the other policeman. Turning to Apollo, Storm scratched its head and said, Good find, buddy. The dog looked up, tongue out, and panting, seemed to smile. After a few minutes, Storm lowered the tailgate on his pickup. Apollo jumped up and lay next to where the St. Louis deputy sat with his legs dangling. The young woman from the group of ten girls who had spoken to him earlier walked up. They tell me you're a police officer. With a nod, Storm said, My name's Dakota. What's yours? The young woman looked around and then refocused on him. They call me Angel. Yeah, but what's your real name? Isabel? Well, Isabel, it's nice to meet you. I want to thank you for getting us out of there. Storm shrugged. Glad I could help. She clutched the blanket someone had given her tighter around herself. We're not the only ones, you know. Raising an eyebrow, the deputy remained silent. This place is an overnight stop for us girls. We would have been moved again in the morning. How do you know that? That's what we were told. Those shitheads didn't even give us food or water. After closing his eyes and shaking his head slightly, Storm asked, Who brought you here? The girl took a deep breath and blew it out. Tall, bald guy said his name was Billy. I didn't believe him. Who would use your real name in this kind of a situation? She took another breath. Before he locked us in the room, he said he'd be right back with bottled water and burgers. Asshole never returned. Did you know where you were headed? She shook her head. Who are these girls, Isabel? Mostly runaways. Two of us aged out of the foster care system with nowhere to go. What about relatives? Most of us don't have any or they've disowned us. How old are you, Isabel? Old enough. Storm folded his arms and focused on the young woman. The silence lasted for an uncomfortable length of time. Finally, she said, 18. What happened to your parents? I've never met my father. My mother's in prison somewhere in Louisiana. I'm sorry. She shrugged. Not your fault. What about your last foster care parents? After a chuckle, she said, they didn't give a shit. Once the state stopped paying them, they kicked me out. Stevens returned to the pickup. Well, Storm, you uncovered a hornet's nest here. How so? There are enough stolen guns in there to arm a division. We also found a body. Raising an eyebrow, Storm remained silent. Looks like someone killed him execution style. Bullet to the back of the head and he's face down on a concrete floor. Isabel asked, What's he look like? Bald and tall's all I can tell you at the moment. Now I know why he never came back with the food. With a frown, Stevens looked at the girl and then Storm. The deputy said, She just told me someone matching your description brought them here. He was also supposed to bring them food and water. Folding his arms, the police sergeant stared at her for a few moments. Can you identify him? Yeah, if you want me to. Follow me. Turn to Storm. You stay here. Don't leave. By mid-morning, Storm and Apollo were still waiting by the Ford F-150 for Stevens to release them. Noting he wasn't under arrest kept him from being too worried. Apollo, after consuming the contents of Storm's last water bottle, remained quiet, lying next to him on the truck tailgate. The girls were on their way to a clinic. Those under 18 would be transferred to a facility for homeless children. Isabel and another 18-year-old girl would then be taken to a shelter for battered females. Apollo raised his head and stared at the Memphis police sergeant as he approached. 
You're free to go, Storm. Sliding off the tailgate, the St. Louis County deputy asked, What changed your mind? I talked to your commanding officer. Storm remained quiet. He informed me you are one hell of a good deputy and you were in St. Louis yesterday until 6 p.m. With a slight pause, Stevens smiled. The medical examiner thinks the bald guy died around 6.30 last night. What about the girls? They're safe. Looking back at the warehouse, Stevens continued. There are signs throughout the building this is a regular stop for human trafficking. While we knew about it, it's been off our radar for a few months. We appreciate you exposing it for what it was. Any idea who owns the place? A local investment company. The building is handled by a property management service who leased it to a manufacturer out of New Orleans. He chuckled. <laughs> the outfit in New Orleans has no record of leasing the building. How's the rent paid? Whoever rented the building paid cash up front for a year. In other words, a dead end. Appears that way. He paused, stroked his chin, and then took a breath. Uh... We found some disturbing evidence in another section of the place. Let me guess. Drugs. Stevens shook his head. Blood on the floor of a different storage room. We aren't sure what it means, but the forensic guys are telling me it's from five different individuals. At 15 minutes before 9 p.m., Storm and Apollo were situated in a motel on the city's south side. While he studied his wife's journal, Apollo slept on the floor next to him. Without warning, the border collie's head snapped erect and his ears straightened. Storm heard a growl building deep within the dog's throat. He reached over to the bed and extracted his personal automatic pistol, a Sig Sauer P226, from his backpack. Apollo stood and approached the door, sniffing the sill. He then started barking furiously. Stepping over to a wall next to the room's window, Storm moved the curtain so he could peek out. Two men stood there, their faces covered with ski masks and holding pistols. They both pointed their gun at the door. Storm whistled and Apollo ran to his side just as the two men started firing into the door of his hotel room. The larger of the two raised his foot and slammed it against the door which flew open. As the intruder rushed into the room, Storm fired his Sig Sauer twice. The man collapsed on the floor. Blood immediately started seeping into the carpet. The only sound the deputy heard was footfalls of someone running off into the darkened hotel parking lot. Memphis Police Sergeant George Stevens examined the body lying in the entrance to the hotel room. He looked up at Storm. I know this guy. It's been the topic of many conversations during our morning briefings. I seriously doubt anyone will miss him. Standing, Stevens examined the bullet holes in the door. Looks like they were pointing down. Storm nodded. Apollo was at the door barking. Glad they missed. So am I. Okay, Storm, why'd they come after you? I have no clue, Sergeant. He folded his arms. My question is, how did they know where I was staying? I didn't even make the decision to stay here until I drove past it. Apparently, they know you're the one who found the girls. Probably found you here from the warehouse. He watched the medical examiner. Technicians load the dead man onto a gurney. We have positive ID on the body we found there. Who was he? William Mallard. Isabel told me he wanted to be called Billy. There you go. He's from New Orleans, and one of the NOPD detectives told me he's knee-deep in the smuggling trade there. He also expressed relief he was now my problem. Storm tilted his head. Why are you telling me all of this, Sergeant? Because we didn't know any of this 24 hours ago until you showed up. Now I've got two dead thugs and ten homeless teenage girls. Better than ten dead ones. Stevens looked over his glasses at Storm. There is that. He paused. Why is it all this happens after you start snooping around? Walking over to the desk in the hotel room, Storm picked up the journal and tossed it to Stevens. Because I found that. Catching the object, Stevens flipped through it. It's a book, so? Are you going to arrest me? The sergeant shook his head. No, Storm, you seem to know more about this situation than anyone. I'd like to get your help. Pointing at the book, the deputy said, My wife and son were killed in a head-on collision three years ago. 
He then told Stevens about the prisoner who confessed to orchestrating the accident on his deathbed. I found the journal with some Christmas ornaments I had not touched for years. It outlines the criminal organization William Mallard belonged to. The sex trafficking has been going on for at least a decade or longer. It tells how my wife escaped and started a new life. These guys chose to punish her because they thought she'd talk. She never told anyone about her experiences, except in the journal. I'd like for her words to help shut these assholes down. Stevens skimmed over several pages, shut the book, and handed it back to Storm. Like I said, my department is requesting your help. I'd have to clear it with my commander. That's already in the works. My boss will be talking to yours sometime today. The ringing of Storm's cell phone interrupted the discussion. Just a second, Sergeant. Pressing the accept call icon, the deputy said, This is Storm. Dakota, it's Carter. What's up? Storm could hear emergency vehicles, sirens spooling down and the din of men shouting above a roar in the background. We got called by a fire. It's your house, man. Silence filled the hotel room as Storm stared at a wall. How bad? Looks to be fully engulfed, but I'm just a county deputy, not a firefighter. Glancing at his watch, Storm did the math in his head. I'm four hours away. I'll leave right now. After ending the call, he looked at Stevens. My house is on fire. I've got to go back to St. Louis. Give me your cell number and I'll talk to my commander while I'm there. Dakota, you're probably guessing this gang set it on fire. Yeah, I wouldn't want to bet against it. Going on close to 30 hours without sleep, except for a quick nap during the afternoon, Storm headed north on I-55. The time approached 2 a.m. as he passed the last exit for Sykeston, Missouri. At this time of night, traffic on the divided highway could only be described as non-existent. So when he noticed a pair of headlights rapidly approaching from behind, he paid attention. He lifted the lid for the center console of the F-150 and extracted his Sig Sauer. Heads up, Apollo. The dog, having fallen asleep on the back seat, jumped into the front on the passenger side, his attention on the back window. Storm mumbled. This could be nothing, but let's not take chances. The headlights approached rapidly and appeared to almost collide with the back of the pickup. Just as fast, it swung to their left trying to pass. Slamming on the brakes, the F-150 skidded as a larger vehicle sped past. Storm heard a loud crack as a starburst pattern formed on the far right side of the windshield. The other truck accelerated and disappeared into the night. Looking at Apollo, who appeared unharmed, he said, You okay, boy? The dog just panted and looked at Storm. Good. He pulled the truck over to the shoulder and parked. Consulting his cell phone, he looked for an alternate route north. We need to find a less obvious way home. Five hours after leaving the hotel in Memphis, Storm pulled up to his now burned out house. The deputy who called him earlier stood next to a squad car talking to a fireman. One fire engine remained on the scene and yellow crime scene tape roped off the perimeter of what remained of his home. Storm walked up to the two men, Apollo close to his right heel. As he and Carter shook hands, Storm said, Looks like this was a tough one to put out. Carter nodded. Dakota, this Jake Riley, he's fire marshal. Two men shook and Storm asked, Where did it start? We think we've identified three accelerant locations, all on the rear of the house. By the time the first engine got here, the back half of the house was fully engulfed. The house was lost before we even started fighting it. So it was arson. Rather aggressive arson, if you ask me. No effort to make it look like an accident. Taking a deep breath, Storm blew it out as he gazed over the charred remains of the house he and his wife purchased five years earlier. Placing his hand on his friend's shoulder, Carter said, The captain's aware of what's happened. He asked me to tell you anything you need, just let him know. I appreciate that. After a short pause, he turned to the fireman. How long before I can access the site? My team will have to search it first, but I'd say we can give you access sometime late today. With a nod, Storm returned to his pickup, allowing the dog to jump into the Ford before he got behind the wheel, he said, Now I'm pissed, Apollo. Let's find these guys and shut them down. Four days later. Negotiating with the insurance company about his house and replacing his old pickup for a different vehicle took most of the week. 
Storm found a used Ford Police Interceptor utility vehicle available at a local Ford dealership. Being the police version of a Ford Explorer, he traded the F-150 for the SUV. With a more powerful engine than a civilian Explorer, he would be able to outrun another highway incident. The vehicle also gave him another advantage. He knew how to maneuver it, having driven one as a deputy. On day four, he met with Captain Guy McBride. Are you going to rebuild the house? Storm shook his head. Nah, a real estate company has the lot for sale and I'll use the insurance money to buy somewhere else. I'm sure this happened, Dakota. Sir, I have reason to believe the individuals who burned my house are also the ones who killed Judy and Todd. Hmm. It's personal now. Not a good combination, Dakota. As a friend, I'd advise against pursuing this vendetta. What would you do? McBride remained silent for a long time. Finally, he shook his head. Probably the same thing. What can I do to help? Authorize me to be on loan to the Memphis Police Department. Do you plan to come back? I plan to, but... You're a good officer, Storm. I'd hate to lose you. If I don't help stop these guys, they'll eventually succeed in shutting me up. So, you'd be assisting my return to St. Louis. Southwest of Memphis Utilizing information provided by Judy's journal, Storm staked out an old rundown motel just outside of Tunica, Mississippi. According to the missive, the location served as a way station for transporting sex workers who worked the Tunica casinos. Sitting in his Explorer with Apollo in the seat next to him, he watched the comings and goings of the area surrounding the inn. Hidden in the parking lot of a strip mall across from the building, he concentrated on a van parked at the northern end of the structure. The van possessed a Louisiana license plate, plus the windows were heavily tinted, preventing observation of the passengers. At exactly 9.40 p.m., four young females entered the van and a burly man got behind the wheel. It pulled out and headed west toward the casinos. Storm picked up his radio and said, Target is traveling west on 713 toward Casino Strip Resort Boulevard. 10-4, we see it. Roger that. Storm noticed another car pull out of the motel parking lot and follow the van. From what he could see, two men sat in the front of the vehicle. White Toyota Camry with two men following van. 10-4. There was a pause. Got it. Keep an eye on your location. Notify if needed. Roger that. Putting the Explorer in gear, he eased the vehicle out of the parking slot and headed toward the motel to see if he could detect any additional activity. Just before he exited the mall parking lot, his radio went active. Shots fired! Shots fired! Officer down! Without hesitation, Storm accelerated the vehicle in the direction the van and Camry traveled. Coming up on the scene, Storm saw two men on the ground next to the Camry and another by the van with two officers administering first aid. The four females faced the van, their hands above their heads against the vehicle, a police officer behind them. He screeched the SUV to a halt and jumped out. Apollo followed, hot on his heels. Sergeant Stevens, who kept an eye on the girls, pointed toward a vacant field. The van driver took off on foot. See if you and Apollo can find him. Yanking his badge attached to a lanyard out from under his sweatshirt, he gripped his Sig Sauer and took off into the open field, Apollo sprinting out in front of him. The dog stopped and sniffed the ground for a few seconds. He then took off at a hard run heading toward Storm's left. With a waxing gibbous moon in the eastern sky, Storm was able to follow Apollo fairly easily. As the canine neared a grove of trees, he slowed and looked back at Storm. Catching up with the dog, the deputy kneeled beside him. Where is he, Apollo? Taking off again, Storm followed his partner. After the dog rushed into the grove, the deputy heard a man curse as he exited the cover of trees at a run. Apollo, doing what the breed had been bred to do for hundreds of years in Scotland, basically herded the man out of the trees. He could be seen constantly nipping at the fugitive's heels and then backing off. Suppressing a chuckle, Storm took a weaver stance and yelled, Halt! Let me see your hands! The man looked at Storm and then the dog. He stopped running, shook his head, and raised his arms. As he approached the fugitive, the deputy said, On your knees, hands behind your head. Looking up, he said, You're Dakota Storm. Ignoring the statement, the deputy placed handcuffs on the man's wrists and swung his arms behind him. The prisoner continued. 
Did you know you're a dead man walking storm? Memphis. George Stevens approached the desk currently occupied by Dakota Storm with two cups of coffee in his hands. He set one in front of Storm and then settled into a chair at the desk next to his new friend. Tomorrow's Christmas, Dakota. Taking his attention away from the computer screen, he looked at Stevens. Thanks for the coffee. Yeah, I know. Any plans? After taking a sip from the paper cup, Storm shook his head. Not really. If the weather holds, I thought I'd take Apollo somewhere and let him run. Why? Stevens just nodded as he sipped coffee. The wife and I are having a few friends over for dinner. Would you like to join us? I wouldn't want to intrude. Nonsense. Swing on by round one. I'm deep frying a turkey. Storm nodded. Thanks. Sounds good. Have you spoken to Jacob Gordon yet? Not today, why? He's been asking questions about you. Seems he's some kind of big shot within the U.S. Marshal Service. No, he hasn't talked to me other than when I turned the van driver over to him. With a chuckle, Stephen stood. <laughs> I meant to tell you nice work bringing him in so fast. Apollo deserves the credit. Yeah, well, nice work anyway. Five minutes later, Storm's coffee, now cold, needed a warm-up. As he stood, he saw Jacob Gordon making a beeline toward his desk. After the two men shook hands, Gordon said, I understand you recently lost your house in a fire? Yes, I did. What are your plans on where to live? Since I'm here in Memphis, that hasn't been a problem yet. Gordon nodded. Nice work bringing the van driver in so quickly. Thanks, Apollo did all the heavy lifting. Standing two inches taller than Storm, the man folded his arms. Ever thought about applying to the U.S. Marshal Service? When I got out of the military, I did, but my late wife was pregnant at the time and didn't want me away from home, so I took a job with the St. Louis County Sheriff's Department. Sorry about your loss, Storm. He paused. You were dog handler in the military, right? Yes, sir. Actually, I was a trainer at Lakeland Air Force Base in Texas. Gordon nodded. I read that. I've been authorized to offer you a chance to become a U.S. Deputy Marshal. Are you interested? Doing what, sir? What you did the other day, tracking down fugitives and bringing them in. What about Apollo? Gordon smiled. I wouldn't want to break up a winning team. Can I think about it? Sure. Let me know after Christmas. Christmas Day. Germantown, Tennessee. Arriving an hour late at George Stevens' house more than likely saved Dakota Storm's life. Approaching the residence in a nice neighborhood of Germantown, the presence of police and EMT vehicles caused his stomach to clinch. After parking on the street, he clipped his badge on his belt and opened the door. Turning to Apollo, he said, Stay. The dog relaxed and remained in the passenger seat. Rushing across the street, he ducked under yellow tape and immediately went to an officer keeping attendance of who entered the scene. Showing his badge, Storm told the man his name. The policeman wrote it down and said, U.S. Marshal Gordon wants to see you. He's in the back. With a nod, Storm sprinted around the house. When he rounded the corner, he saw Gordon talking to several uniformed officers. As he approached their location, Gordon broke away from the group and met Storm. Glad you're here. What happened? Stevens was out here tending to a turkey in a fryer when five men in ski masks confronted him. They forced him inside. Is he dead? No, but his wife and three of his guests are. He's critically wounded, but was able to tell first responders what happened. I was supposed to be here at one. Best you weren't. Where's Apollo? In my SUV. Get him. Storm let Apollo sniff around where the turkey fryer had been. When the dog stopped and looked at his partner, he sat. His signal, he had a scent. When the deputy made a circling motion with his hand, the dog took off toward the northwest, its nose close to the ground. Following his partner, Storm could tell the canine had a strong trail to follow. He did not deviate from his tracking, nor did he stop and sniff the air. He kept his nose to the ground and forged ahead. Located in a relatively new neighborhood, numerous vacant lots surrounded George Stevens' home. When Apollo stopped at the curb of a cul-de-sac, he raised his nose and sniffed the air. Catching up to the dog, Storm surveyed the few homes in the area. 
on one across from where he stood, he saw what he needed. Christmas evening. Jacob Gordon stood in front of the members of the task force in the briefing room. He said, The hospital reports George Stevens is in critical condition. Prognosis is not good. Surveying the room, he continued, Deputy Storm located a ring camera image of the attackers. He touched a button on an open laptop and an image on the screen behind him appeared. This is a still shot of the vehicle the men arrived in. Note there is a clear shot of a license plate. Deputy Storm was able to trace it to the Avis rental kiosk at the Memphis airport. He touched the mouse again. Another image appeared. This is a photograph from the Louisiana Office of Motor Vehicles. Meet the individual who rented the SUV identified in the picture. His name is Frank Jackson, a.k.a. Gimpy. The vehicle was returned to the airport and at this moment is being processed by an FBI forensic team. The picture showed a dark-haired male in his mid-30s. A hand shot up in the back of the room. Gordon pointed at the man. Yeah, Bob. We found that name registered at the motel where the girls were found. Looking at the image on the wall, Gordon took a breath. Ladies and gentlemen, this might be our first break. He turned back to the group. Let's find out everything we can about our Mr. Frank Jackson. Storm parked his car outside the door to his hotel room. He turned to Apollo and held up the sack from a local Chinese carryout. I know it's not a fancy Christmas meal, boy, but there's not much open tonight. Apollo sat and panted. Suddenly, the dog's ears perked up, and he stared out the rear driver's side passenger window. Dropping the sack, Storm grabbed his Sig Sauer he now kept within easy reach and ducked below the window. Just as he did this, the driver's window shattered as he pushed the door open. A shadow drew his attention and he fired the 9mm pistol. Apollo dove out and chased after the shadow. Rolling on the driveway, he jumped up and took off in pursuit of Apollo and the assailant. A shot sounded and he felt the bullet whiz by his ear. Adrenaline pushed him forward with the need to protect Apollo at all costs. The sound of the dog catching the running man came to his ears as he closed the distance. He heard Apollo growl and the man curse. A street light illuminated the scene before him. The suspect stood with the pistol aimed at the canine. When he saw the deputy running toward him, he raised his weapon. Storm fired just as the assailant's gun went off. Midnight. Jacob Gordon leaned against the doorframe of the hospital treatment room, a smile on his face. Well, Dakota, looks like you're gonna live. A sad smile came to Storm's face. How's Apollo doing? Fit as a fiddle. Good. Where is he? He had a gash on his rib cage, which the vet said probably came from Frank Jackson's pistol. He's resting comfortably at the vet's office. How'd you find a vet this late? I'm with the U.S. Marshal Service. We take care of our team. He paused. How's the shoulder feeling? Other than a bullet passing through muscle, stiff. He paused. Where's Jackson? After being patched up by EMTs, they transferred him to the FBI office here in Memphis. He's singing like a bird. Apparently, once they explained to him how he was being charged with the murder of a police officer and three others, he found religion. Good. He told me he thought you were going to pull the trigger any second while you waited for backup. The thought crossed my mind. The deputy paused. I heard you say Jackson goes by the name Gimpy. Yeah. An informant told me he was the man who ordered my wife and son's murder. A frown crossed the marshal's face. You have any evidence? No, just the word of a dying man. Storm took a breath and let it out slowly. Any news about Stevens? Yeah, he didn't make it. Sorry, Dakota. He was a good man. Yes, he was. The marshal paused. Did you have a chance to think over my offer? Storm nodded. And? As long as it's a package deal with Apollo included, I'm on board. Gordon chuckled. <laughs> Wouldn't have it any other way.